Welcome to Brew Crime. This is Mike. And Beck. And uh, we're here to bring you some stories on theme parks or freak shows. Mm-hmm. This episode's a little late. We had some scheduling issues last weekend. Mm-hmm. So let's get right to it. What is your story about this week? Okay, my story this week is called A Selfish Shellfish, The Story of Grady Styles Jr., Young love, family conflict, murder, and not one, but two bearded ladies. I can't make this shit up. Awesome. All right, the pairing for this story is from Dunham Brewing, which is in Dunham, Quebec. This is the Funk Royale. It is a Fodor Grisette Saison with Montreal plums. And it comes in at 5.2% alcohol. And it's got uh, quite the freak show label itself Mm -hmm. yeah it's amazing eyeball in a very muscly uh woman i think with the bikini and big boots but Mm -hmm. can't really tell kind of fits in with the uh, freak show though yeah all right so it's kind of a cloudy pink no head really roma's kind of mild but it's definitely plums, and it's kind of sour. What's this? What do you see in there? Oh, you see sediment? Yeah, lots. Oh, yeah, there's I'm definitely going to be sediment in a beer that's uh, wild fermented, aged in oak fooders, which are huge oak barrels. It's really sour. Mm-hmm. It's like just, it's just before being sour, just for the sake of being sour. Yeah. It's not Cascade brewing out of Portland, Oregon or anything, but it's quite sour. There's definitely plums. What's that aftertaste? Which one? It's probably just like the lactic acid from the the sourness. Yeah, Yeah, it's like... It's kind of lemon juicy, too. That's weird. It's nice. Not for everyone, but... No, I I like it. It's weird, but I like it. So that's fitting. Yeah, it's quite fitting for the story, I think. So, uh, Grady Franklin Stiles Jr. was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, June 26, 1937, to Grady Sr. and Edna Stiles. The Stiles family had a history of, my attempt at saying this word, um, ectrodactyly. It's E-C-T-R-O-D-A-C-T-Y-L-Y. Interesting. I've never heard that word before. Neither had I, and my word program did not accept it as a real word. Uh, anyway, um, ectrodactyly um, is a genetic condition in which the middle fingers are missing, and the fingers on either side of where they should be are fused together to form claw-like extremities. This condition can also affect the feet, as was the case with Grady Jr. Um, The family had uh, years, decades of this condition going back all the way to 1840 was the first case in their family because it's genetic. Um, Grady Sr. was a sideshow attraction and a traveling carnival when his son was born. He added his son to the act when Grady Jr. turned seven. Wow. Yeah, so young. Isn't that like child labor? (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. Um, I don't imagine that would have been... Let's see, he was born in 1937, so 1944. Don't imagine there were a lot of strict labor laws then. True, yeah. Um, While traveling with the carnival, uh, Grady Jr. met a woman named Mary Teresa Herzog... She just went by Teresa. She had no mutations, but at 19 had run away to join the carnival. Because why not? Yeah, why not, right? When you're 19, doesn't everyone? Well, it's probably better than just getting straight into drugs, but (laughs) probably got in there anyways. Those are the two life options, just so you all know. Join a carnival or start hard drugs. Both bad life decisions. Mm -hmm. Um, anyway, when, uh, Teresa joined the carnival, she met and fell in love with Grady and the two married and had three children. 
Two of them, Grady Styles the third and Kathy also had ectrodactyly. So like his father before him, um, Grady Styles Jr. took his family on the road and made his two kids part of his sideshow as the Lobster family. Yeah. Due to his um, ectrodactyly, he was in a, unable to walk, so although he had a wheelchair, he typically used his hands and arms to get around. S he developed substantial upper body strength, which was very dangerous to others when combined with his bad temper and alcoholism. Oh, fun! Yeah. Nice guy, he though. doesn't want a bad-tempered alcoholic with super strength. Right? Yeah, I know for sure. It's Evil genius? Fun for all ages. Super villain? So this next part is really violent and really graphic, so feel free to skip ahead if you don't want to hear about it. Um, one night in 1973, Grady fought with his wife, Teresa, and he threw her to the ground and ripped her IUD out with his bare hands. Oh. <laughs> like, I would, what the fuck? Like, yeah. what did, I don't, there's nothing else to say to that. So she promptly divorced him. Awesome. Yeah. Of yeah. course. Because uh, he's a piece of garbage. And somehow he eventually got married again. And her name was Barbara Browning, but she also divorced him. So in Pittsburgh in 1978, Grady's 15-year-old daughter, Donna, she was the one that didn't have um, ectrodactyly, announced that she was in love and engaged. Her fiancé, Jack, was an 18-year-old high school dropout. Uh, Grady didn't approve and began, began to threaten Jack's life. He even went so far as to take Donna to a pawn shop where he bought a thirty two caliber revolver and told her that it was to use on Jack. Oh, nice. So, yeah, specific. Um, Donna left her father's home and stayed with Jack's sister for six days. Uh, she called her father from there. During that phone call, he told her that if she wasn't home in five minutes, he'd beat the hell out of her and kill Jack. So just a class act yeah, all just around. Yeah, piece of garbage. Yeah. Um, her response was that if he wouldn't consent to the marriage, they would just live together unwed. And Grady backed down, saying that he would rather consent to the marriage than see them live in sin. Oh, God. Which I think is just, whatever, a joke. Yeah, religion for the loss again. Mm -hmm. The wedding was set for September 28th. Uh, the day before, Donna, her stepmother, Barbara, and Jack went and bought a wedding dress for Donna. When they returned, Grady was inside without his wheelchair. The three of them went to retrieve it, but Grady called Jack back in. <coughs> Don't do it! <coughs> <laughs> After a quick back and forth, Grady pulled the pawn shop gun out from under the couch cushion he was sitting on and shot Jack in the chest. Jack turned to run, and Grady shot him in the back. Jack made it outside to Donna and said, He shot me, before dying in her arms. Her father just sat on the porch smiling and said, Told you I'd kill him. <laughs> and when the police came, Grady said, Take me, I'm ready. At least he was ready. The trial lasted a few days and included... Character witnesses, such as a circus fat lady who got stuck in the witness chair. <laughs> <laughs> I almost bit my beer up. <laughs> and a bearded lady. Uh, Styles' ex-wife, Teresa, came up from Florida with her new husband, who performed as the world's smallest man. And with Donna, who had fled Pittsburgh to live with her mother. You wouldn't happen to know how tall that guy was? <laughs> no. There's some can... small people out there. Yeah. Um, he wasn't in any of the pictures I saw, actually. Uh, no. There were pictures. Well, he probably was in the picture, you just couldn't okay, see him. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> There no. were pictures of, uh, Teresa at the case, uh, like, there to support her ex-husband, I guess, or, I don't know why, I don't, whatever. Yeah, who knows? It's her life choice, not mine. Grady portrayed himself as a concerned father trying to protect his underage daughter from an older man. He claimed self-defense, saying that 
uh, Jack had lunged for him. The jury didn't buy it, and he was found guilty of third-degree murder. So, good news, bad news. Bad news first, he was not sent to prison because there was no state institution equipped to care for an inmate with uh, ectrodactyly. Okay. And on top of that, the judge felt... The judge also felt bad because Grady had cirrhosis of the liver and emphysema. So he gave Grady 15 years of probation instead. Because of excess, you get probation. Yeah, right, because that's fair. So just Okay, so time to start drinking heavily and smoking heavily so you don't have to go to jail. Yeah, so be just be an abusive, alcoholic asshole your whole adult life and take someone else's life. But you're sick, so 15 years probation. Wow. Like, who who smoked all those cigarettes? Yeah. Who drank all that alcohol? Oh, you did. It was yeah. your choice to destroy your body. Okay, well, too bad then. Yeah, 19, uh, what did you say? What is it? What year? That uh, Approximately 1940s? Uh, it, this would have been in 1979 oh, okay. with the case. Yeah, still horrible uh, gender issues there, I think. Yeah, I don't know. So, um, so this total bullshit decision just led to Grady becoming an even cockier asshat. Because he, he would just tell everyone, yeah, doesn't matter what I do, I can get away with murder. So just threatening people and yeah. just doing whatever he wanted because now he knows he can't go to jail. Yeah, no shit. So the good news is that he stopped drinking and moved uh, to Gib- Gibsonton, Florida, which is a city where many other carnival performers lived during the winter season. When they oh, weren't nice. touring, apparently Gibsonton, Florida, of course it's in Florida, right? Yeah. Is the place to be. Um, Teresa also lived there, though, which I thought was really weird. But whatever. Who knows? Must be a big town. A lot of, yeah, I mean, a lot of carnival workers. She back does then. like to be around uh, the carnival, so. Yes. Um, so Teresa and Grady uh, reconnected divorced their respective spouses and in 1989 remarried <laughs> like come That's... on lady don't you remember what happened yeah no shit <sighs> he so, won't do it to me he loves me but she was the one that he did it to before no, I know. like yeah oh, he's changed yeah okay so yum 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 mm, good beer. <laughs> they lived with several of their children and from their marriage and from their respective marriages. Uh, one of the children was Harry Glenn Newman the third. He was Teresa's grown son who was overweight and had an IQ of seventy nine. He performed as the human blockhead, hammering <laughs> nails into his nostrils. Oh, nice! Who needs yeah. that nostril, anyways? Yeah, isn't that how most people did um, lobotomies? In through the nose. <laughs> yep. 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 Wonder if it went down every time he did it. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. Actually started as a genius and then... Well, probably still stupid. Yeah. But, yeah. Stupid enough to stick yeah. a nail up his nose. But it and might have went down every year. Maybe. Yes. So this uh, Grady's good behavior was short-lived and his family later reported that when he started drinking again, he became even more abusive. On November 29th, 1992... Teresa and Harry hired a 17-year-old sideshow performer named Chris Wyant to kill Grady for $1,500. But it really depends on who you ask, because according to Grady's son, uh, that's Grady Styles the third, uh, his mother and father were arguing, and Harry overheard his mother say, something needs to be done, and went to Chris and repeated it. Shortly after this, Chris shot Grady in the back of the head while he was watching TV. Oh, nice. Yeah, Chris was convicted of second-degree murder and sentenced to 27 years in prison. And Harry was given life in prison as the mastermind. I found a 
couple of web- websites that said that Teresa was convicted of conspiracy to commit murder and sentenced to 43 years in prison, and a couple that said she was convicted of manslaughter and sentenced to 12 years in prison. So I don't know which one is true, but just either way, it's I just think it's bullshit. Yeah. Like, combined, that is life plus 39 or 70 years, depending on what Teresa's real sentence was, for killing a violently abusive piece of shit. But meanwhile, he killed someone and got 15 years probation. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, I don't know. Just a system is... Fucked? Yeah, flawed, for sure. That's a good word, too. (laughs) F-words are fun. Uh... (laughs) Grady was buried at Sunset Memory Gardens near Tampa, and a bouquet of flowers was left on his coffin with a banner reading, From Your Loving Wife. He was so hated in his community that no one was willing to be the pallbearer. Nice. Yeah. Even dead, no one wants to be near you, because you're a dick. So even for those of you who haven't heard this story, you probably still recognize Grady's likeness. Uh, it was used uh, as the cover for S- Silverchair's 1997 album Freak Show. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah. I love that album. Yeah. Um, so we'll have a picture of that on the website. And as of 2016, Grady Styles the Third. Uh, was still performing at the Venice Beach Freak Show in uh, Los Angeles. Huh. And that is where he met his girlfriend, Jessa Olmsted, who performs there as the Bearded Lady. Um, Christopher Wyant was released from prison in 2009, and Harry died in prison in 2014. Among his tattoos was one on his arm that read, Forgive me, Mother. And Teresa was released from prison in 2000, went back to Gibsonton, and tattooed on her buttock was Grady Styles Jr. What the fuck <laughs> is wrong with you? I guess it is the place to put it. But <laughs> yeah. On your ass. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> oh, anyway, weird. that's the end. It's the story. It's a mess. Yeah. That's all it is. Let's bring it out with this again. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. I love that song. <laughs> <laughs> nice and ridiculous. Mm-hmm. What a weird family. Yeah. I Quintessentially don't... American. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the American dream. Well, it is Florida. Yeah. Oh, my. All right, on to my story now. First off, I'd like to thank uh, Megan Moe of the Facebook group True Crime Podcast for the story idea. Um, Really appreciate it. So the title of this one is Rape, Murder, and the Holy Land. So let's get into the beer pairing first. This is from Old Yale Brewing in Chilliwack. It is the Vanishing Monk Belgian Wit Beer. It's an unfiltered Belgian-style wit beer with hints of orange and coriander, a slightly tart finish, and a fluffy white head. Oh, use it to steam mussels or pair with a fresh fruit salad. No, I don't like that. (laughs) I don't like that either, but whatever. Our Vanishing Monk Belgian wit beer is a seasonal release. The beer comes in at 5% alcohol, and it's got 20 IBU. (laughs) Oh, jeez. Throwback. Oh, shit. (laughs) Sorry, Mike. Nope. I was like, I can't take my headphones off. That was exciting. That bottle was a little overcarbonated mm. and exploded all over me, all over the floor. We got most of it left, though, so it's in our glass now. All right. Now that the uh, head has settled down a little bit, it's like a cloudy, kind of light yellow color, white head. A what? lot of it. <laughs> well, it's it, it looks like only like a half inch now, but it was... Yeah. Insanely carbonated. The bottle is empty, but it still has half a bottle of carbonation head in it. So, yeah. I've never seen that happen before. I, I mean, have. I've seen people spill beer before, and it's tragic every time. But I've never seen a bottle with no beer 
half full of head. Well, that's true. Yeah, usually by then it's gone. Although one of my homebrew bottles that we did hit the ceiling once, so it's not quite as bad here. It's definitely lemony, a little bit of tartness, and I think it said coriander, didn't it? Yeah. Kind of get that in there. Mm. I jumped ahead and had some already. Yeah. It's just a nice light flavor. It's kind of wheat and grain with some lemon and coriander. Nothing too exciting, but Mm -hmm. it's tasty. Mm -hmm. The excitement was all in the pouring of it or opening of it. Yep. I was a little worried there. With that explosion, usually the beer will be off, but it's not, which is good. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, a religious theme park for me would be kind of a scary place, but this is scary for a different reason. All right. So did the title get your attention? Well, I'm sure that you can guess with today's theme that this is not a case over in Jerusalem or the birthplace of so many religions. No, this case takes place at Holy Land, USA, a defunct 18-acre theme park in Waterbury, Connecticut, USA. Okay, let's start out with some information about this weird abandoned place first, as it will set the scene. Holy Land, USA was founded in 1955 by John Baptist Greco, an attorney and Roman Catholic. The plan for this theme park was to recreate Bethlehem and Jerusalem of the biblical era. John Baptist Greco was a very religious man who believed that no one, no matter race, creed, or color, should be separated. So that's a nice change. Not the current uh, outlook of a lot of those people. Yeah, that's for sure. This was not a place for excitement, though, as it was more a place to sit and be peaceful. Already sounds boring. Yeah. I can do that at home. Yeah, exactly. For free. This park boasted attractions like the Garden of Eden, a diorama depicting Daniel in the lion's den. I don't even know what that is. And many recreations of the life and ministry of Jesus. Woo! The centerpiece of this park was a 56-foot tall cross and the limited sign that read Holy Land USA. The park was most popular in the 1960s and 70s, but closed down in 1984. I can't even believe it was open that long. Yeah. U.S. East Coast. I don't know. At its peak, it attracted 40,000 visitors annually. (laughs) The plan was to reopen the park in an improved and expanded park, but Breco died in 1986. Mm. The park was left to the Filipini Sisters, also known as Sisters of St. Lucie Filipini, a Catholic institute devoted to education. Sadly for fans of the park, it never reopened and fell into disrepair over the years. In 2002, the Visitors Bureau of the area was receiving 150 calls a year for directions to the defunct site. With no fences, you could just wander onto the site. They did recommend that if you wanted to explore the site, to ensure that you explore with caution and with an up-to-date tetanus shot. <laughs> <laughs> I, th- I would do that, actually. I'd be curious to see that. Yeah, so would I. Now that it's closed, it's not as creepy. Well, it's differently creepy. It's good good creepy. Good creepy, yeah. The site has been vandalized heavily. Shocking. (laughs) And while there have been pushes by religious groups to reopen the site, it still sits closed to the general public. Mm. Now, why anyone would want to go to this place in its heyday, I have no idea. But I can totally understand when it's defunct and falling apart. Unfortunately, in 2010, things took a dark turn on the Holy Land USA property. Now, while this crime had nothing to do with the Catholic Church, it sure resonates true with the abuse that goes on in the Church and the and is hidden by the Vatican. As you'd expect, an abandoned theme park, even one of a religious background, with would become the hangout spot for teens. I'm sure it would be a place for young people to come and rebel. On July 15, 2010, 16-year-old Chloe Ottoman and her friend of two years, 19-year-old Francisco Cruz, headed out to Holy Land to hang out. Sorry, how old was she? 16. You heard that right. Yeah, 16 and 19. Yeah. (laughs) Chloe Ottoman was said to be a very open person who was quick to befriend anyone she met, according to her family. Sadly, this did not end well for this poor young woman. Cruz had managed to get a hold of four cans of juice... J-O-O-S-E, an alcoholic drink for them to partake in at the park. Looking online, these drinks do not mess around as they come in at 9.9% ABV in a 24-ounce can. 
as well as 12% and 14% in 23.5 ounce cans. I don't know which version they had that night, but two cans of these are good to get many people quite drunk. Two of them drank their juice underneath the huge illuminated crucifix that stands at the park at the top of Pine Hill that overlooks Interstate I-87. Cruz, the loser that he is, started groping Chloe, but she kept pushing his hands away. He later told police that he always had a crush on her. She asked him to stop and told him that she had a boyfriend and as such, it would not be right for them to fool around. He continued to grab at her and she finally began to get pissed off and elbowed him in the face, knocking him off his glasses. While I'm happy she stood up for herself, this only angered Cruz. He proceeded to put her into a chokehold. As would only be expected, she began to scream for help, hoping that someone would be nearby and come running. He proceeded to cover her mouth with his left hand. Sadly, it did not end there, though. He undressed Chloe as well as himself and proceeded to rape her. During the attack, she gasped for air twice, and this threw him into a rage, and after this, he decided to kill her. He proceeded to push both thumbs back into her neck until she died. Wish you could say this was the end of the story, but Cruz is a sick, demented human. He proceeded to rape her once again, once she had died, and then stabbed her in the neck four times. He knew at this point she had already been dead. He then proceeded to throw her belongings into the woods nearby. I will never understand how someone you have been friends with for years could do this. It just does not make sense. When Chloe did not show up home the next day, the family reported her missing. At first, when questioned, Cruz denied that he had been with Chloe the night before, and he even helped the search for her with the other friends. According to the Waterbury police captain, Chris Corbett, Cruz was the last person seen with Ottoman. In the end, though, he confessed to the murder and led police to her body under the cross at Holy Land, USA. He was arraigned on Monday and held with a $5 million bond, and he was held behind bars until his case could be tried. When Francisco Cruz's trial started, he was up for a capital felony murder, sexual assault, and second-degree strangulation, and could have faced the death penalty. Rightly so. Yeah, although I'm not a supporter of the death penalty, rightly so. <laughs> Chloe Ottoman's family agreed to a plea offer for Cruz, though, as it would prevent years upon years or even decades of delay to carry out justice in this case. Cruz pleaded guilty to murder on April 20th, 2011. This is a quote. They built state prisons for people like this, Prosecutor Patrick Griffin said at Superior Court. It's where he belongs. Griffin also said... That the details of what he had or what had been done to Chloe were the most disturbing things he had seen in his 16 years in the courthouse. Judge Richard Damani felt the same way, saying, This is the most horrific, sadistic statement of fact that I have ever come across. Fred DiCaprio, let's go with that, one of Cruz's two public defenders, told Damani that his client had expressed genuine and sincere, profound remorse for what had happened. Before this conviction, Cruz had no criminal record, he said, despite an upbringing that he described as really extremely depraved. He did not elaborate. According to Fox News, though, Cruz reportedly had two previous misdemeanors. Maybe we finally actually believe Fox News? I don't know. I don't know if that's a good idea. Her family spoke to the court with written statements. First, the mother's statement was read by a high school friend. Reading from Jessica Gargano's written statement, Reedy Young said that Chloe's smile was contagious. She would instantly become friends with anyone she came in contact with. Her father, Derek Ottoman, then broke down as he held up his Father's Day card from Chloe from last year. It had a photo of a pop-up chimp with a playful message of love that personified her. In the end, Cruz, now 20, was sentenced to 55 years in prison for his crimes. Season court officials called this the most disturbing, horrific, and sadistic thing they had ever seen. Once he was sentenced, his family left the court without making any comments. While he will be 75 years old, when or if he gets out of prison, I do not feel this is long enough for him. This should be what the podcast Best Case Worst Case calls a pine box sentence. He should only be leaving the prison in a pine box as he deserves to spend the rest of his life behind bars. Yeah. Are you? It's amazing to think it's been a year since this happened. You remember how profound an impact this had on so many people here in the Waterbury community, obviously when a teenager dies. Well, today Francisco Cruz, learning his fate, walked into a Waterbury Superior courtroom wearing an orange jumpsuit. Now, usually in situations like this, Chris, as you well know, the accused here gets the chance to say something to the family. Cruz 
said nothing, did not say a word, did not apologize to any of Chloe's family, any of Chloe's friends. The judge telling Cruz today that where you wake up is where you will die in jail. We'll have more coming up tonight at 5 and 6. For now, though, we are live in Waterbury. I'm Jamie Miro, News 8. Sounds like the judge agrees with me. Mm-hmm. Outside the courthouse, Chloe's father spoke about the fact that although Cruz did not speak in court, he owes him a personal apology. He was quoted as saying, obviously, it's a no-brainer. The apology has to come from him, and I can't pull it out of him. But Derek Ottoman is not naive and is not waiting around for it to happen either. He works to come to terms with what has happened, though. As he said to Domini in court, I personally don't want to be in hell for the rest of my life. The bottom line is, either you move on with your life or you don't. It's quoted, Chloe was a fairly open and unguarded person, Ottoman said outside the courtroom. Chloe Ottoman attended Crosby High School with Cruz, who was a friend of her boyfriend's, he said. The friendship was probably closer in his mind than hers. Well, tonight, family and friends are remembering a Waterbury teenager who was raped and murdered. 16-year-old Chloe Ottman was killed at Holy Land last year. News 8's Allie Reed joins us live from Waterbury tonight, where a vigil is being held in her memory. Allie? It was exactly one year ago that Chloe Ottman was raped and murdered here. But tonight, it's not about her death, but rather a celebration of her life. Right now, dozens of her family and friends are arriving for the candlelight vigil that they say is a way to celebrate all the joy she brought to their lives. Her friends say they miss Chloe's smile and energy and say they could always count on her to be there for them. She always would come up if somebody was down. She would always make everybody smile. And um, that was a real big special quality of her. She always made people smile no matter what was going on. So we're all going to be smiling tonight for you, Chloe. Many of her friends are arriving here tonight with purple flowers, wearing purple shirts. That was Chloe's favorite color. They say they don't really have a plan for tonight, but they say the vigil is just really a way to celebrate the girl they loved so much, and they hope to hold this vigil every year on the anniversary of her death. Reporting live in Waterbury, Allie Reed, News 8. So I've added a bunch of photos to the website of both Holy Land and Chloe Ottoman, and unfortunately, Cruz as well. Chloe looks like and it looks and sounds like a happy-go-lucky girl who was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. She looks so young. I mean, I know 16's young, but... Yeah, it's really sad. All right, well, thanks for listening to this episode. And hopefully you'll go to our website, brewcrime.com. Look us up on Twitter at brewcrime. You can email us at brewcrime at pacificbeerchat.com. If you can leave us a uh, review on iTunes or wherever you catch your podcast, that'd be great. Thanks for listening. Brew Crime's intro was created using Creative Commons Attribution Licensed Audio from purple-planet.com, soundbible.com, and freesoundeffects.com. This has been a production of pacificbeerchat.com. Brew Crime is part of the Hopped Up Network. Here is a sample of one of the podcasts you can check out by going to hoppedupnetwork.com. Attention fellow beer geeks, check out Drink and Geek Out, the podcast where we drink beer and geek out. The show is half geek chat and half beer reviews. Typically reviewing one in beer, a beer from Indiana, an out beer, a beer from somewhere else, and a strange brew, which is a mystery brew where we try to guess the unique flavor. We also do mini episodes that we call light episodes where we can really geek out on a specific topic and review a beer that is somehow related. Check us out on all the podcast apps or on social media at Drink In Geek Out. Now here is a promo from a fellow true crime or spooky podcast that we really enjoy. Hope you'll take a listen. Hey y'all, Jen and Lindsay here from Corpus Delicti Podcast, here to tell you to check out our show. If true crime is your thing, it's ours too, with a touch of lightheartedness and a dash of southern charm. We cover compelling cases and crack them open for you. Serial killers, hitmen, historical hallmarks, we've got it all and bring you new episodes every Tuesday morning. You can find us on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and most other podcast apps. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter too. That's C-O-R-P-U-S-D-E. L-I-C-T-I. See you Tuesday.